Okay, good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. My name is Jonathan Perrin, and I am your host for this week's episode of Artists in Residences. Uh, each week, we'll introduce you all to a variety of artists and discuss with them the current events, uh, some new trends in the art community, um, and impact the impact that quarantine has had on all of our lives and practices, uh, things like that. Um, this episode, we are speaking with three incredible artists that you may already know and love. Um, first up, we have Eleanor Owen Kerr, who will speak with us about her photography and the impact that it has had on the course of her life. Um, second, we are happy to have Beth Welch from LASM, who was recently featured in our Flat Curve Gallery. We'll talk with her about her art and how working from home now has kind of changed our workflow. Um, last but not least, we're very excited to announce that we'll be speaking with Chloe Marie, the vocalist from Alabaster Stag. Uh, we'll be chatting about how the quarantine has affected performance artists and how uh, the performance artist uh, community is changing to kind of compensate during these trying times. Um, speaking of quarantine, let's see. We are, where'd it go? Uh, speaking of quarantine, I'd like to take a quick moment to shout out the Flat Curve Gallery presented by Baton Rouge Gallery. Um, Flat Curve Gallery is a resource, a website where you can go and let's see, uh, where you can go and if you're an artist of any age uh, with any media, if you're a if you're a child with crayons or if you're um, an established artist with fine oil paints, you can go to Flat Curve Gallery, fill out a short form, and submit your art to be shown on our website uh, and all of our social media, um, and you can find the. address for Flat Curve Gallery below just there. Um, <laughs> uh, while we are all quarantined together, uh, but apart, we can still stay connected through art. How about that? <laughs> um, let's see. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our partners over at Breck, who have been with us since 1966. Uh, working with us to share the gallery space at City Park. Without them, none of this would be possible. And uh, we're looking forward to returning to business as usual uh, once our doors open again to the public um, at our space in City Park. We'd like to take a moment to uh, thank our Baton Rouge Gallery members and donors. Um, we appreciate everything you've done. Again, you know, none of this can be done without you. Um, if you're not a member, uh, you'll see the little ticker scrolling across the bottom of the screen. That's the website that you can go to uh, to find out more information about being a member, about if you're interested in donating, that uh, option is there for you as well. And um, let's see. Yeah, uh, consider following Baton Rouge Gallery on uh, social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Eleanor Owen Kerr. Eleanor, how are you this afternoon? Hi, Jonathan. Great to talk to you. Hey, yeah, it's good to talk with you too. Um, we've talked a little bit before, you know, and um, it's good to see everybody's doing all right. Um, okay, so to start off, tell us a little bit about yourself and you're, you're a, a film photographer. Yes, I use um, all film-based materials. I process my own um, film here in my dark room and I print all my own photographs on silver-based papers um, in the traditional wet dark room. And I do primarily uh, nature-based landscape photography and some still lives. Yeah, I've got a little example I can bring up here. Um, if you're looking, if you're interested in checking out some of Eleanor's work, you can go to Eleanor, Eleanor uh, com, And let me bring up a little graphic so everybody can see. Okay, Eleanor Owen com, And um, there you'll be able to find a wealth of her available works. Um, okay, so in 
in doing film photography, uh, obviously that presents some challenges. Um, I know maybe film, certain film uh, accoutrement might not be available like it once had been. Uh, is there anything that you do to put your own kind of stamp on the de uh, developing process? Yes, um, it is not as, as widely available as it was even um, 15 years ago when I started doing this in earnest. Um, so aside from hoarding materials that I come across and I have a very large freezer and refrigerator that in my studio where I keep all sorts of um, obsolete materials that um, I, I may hope to use later. I mix a lot of my own developers and um, wow. use bulk chemicals to do that. And I have a large book of recipes and share, you know, recipes with other photographers and we okay. get to play with those kinds of things. So that, that's incredible. You, you really get to put your own stamp on your art, even in, in the, the, the developing stages. That's something maybe not, you know, everybody would have done. <laughs> um, it, it must feel good to kind of get to put that little extra bit of work into what I'm sure is already an evolving process. Yeah. Um, it, you know, you do hear a lot of um, photographers involved in this process who talk about painting with light and in the dark room. And that has been my experience and my feeling about the process. And so it's an extension of that. You, it's the same as a painter who maybe would mix their own pigments. Um, you can actually control the color and the contrast and all sorts of other things that you're doing in the darkroom with the developer that you're using. Speaking of color and contrast, you primarily do black and white developing in photography. I, I do use all, I work exclusively in black and white. Um, it's something that appeals to me. Um, it, it's certainly something that is easier to do in your own dark room. It's possible to print color yourself, but I don't, um, not many people choose to do that. It's much more complicated and uh, less healthy than black and white chemistry, but I've always been drawn to black and white work. Um, there's a graphic element to it and a level of abstraction that in that process of black and white that really appeals to me. Okay. Um. So in, in all this, it, it's, it's involving work. What is it? Well, let me, no, let me change topic. Um, you, you haven't been doing this all your life. You, the photography for you is something you picked up a little later on. Can you tell us about that transition? What was it? Yes. You did before? Um, I, photography is something that I've done um, casually in my private life since I was in college or high school, but I did not pick it up in a serious way until um, just after the year 2000 when uh, I had been practicing law and ironically needed to quit practicing law due to some vision issues that I was having. Wow. And so um, my husband, knowing that I was going to have time on my hands and I think fearing <laughs> what, how crazy I might be, uh, it, without something else to, to do, built me a dark room in, in the attic of my house. And we've now expanded it into a full fledged studio. But um, wow. yeah, so after I quit practicing law, I began studying photography. Is that where you're at right now? Are you in part of your studio? I am in my studio, yes. And I would love to um, show you around if you would like to see any of it. It's, yeah, it's a great um, space. I'm very fortunate. Yeah. Uh, w before we move to that, let me take a look. Uh, let's take a look at some of these pieces right here. This is from a series you have called uh, On the Batcher. Can you explain right. to us just briefly what the yeah. Batcher is? Um, the Batcher you? is the area between the Mississippi River and the levees. And even though I grew up in Baton Rouge, I was completely unfamiliar with it until my friend Michael Hopping said to, who had bought a house on the on the river down in St. John the Baptist Parish. And he said, you need to come see my bachelor. You would love it. And so I went down and I absolutely felt like I had entered maybe another planet, if not another world. Um, 
and just spent the next four or five years going to this area, uh, wearing my snake boots and other protective gear. <laughs> Um, yeah. it, it's like, um, its own little universe separated from the river road and the plants and highways and cities just by the, the, uh, levee. It's an amazing yeah. magical place. When we think of the levee here, you know, in Baton Rouge, it's, you know, this tall grandiose thing with, with, uh, all the sculpture on it and we see the river boats and, you know, things like that. And the barges coming by, it's really kind of, it's kind of interesting to, to see the actual like wild part of it. I really enjoy that aspect of, uh, this whole series. It's, it's yeah. And the interesting, it is very wild. No one goes back there and it changes from month to month and week to week because the river floods and the river, um, goes back down and so what you're left with is not constantly changing seeing a couple comments rolling in here it looks like uh everything's greatly received um thank you for sharing your art with us thank you for taking the time to speak with us do you feel like taking us on a, a quick little tour through sure i would love to so um yep so what you're looking at behind me is this table where i let's see I sit at this table and spot my prints after I make them because it's all by hand and you cannot avoid little dust prints, dust marks on the prints and you actually paint the, the pigments onto the yep. paper. And um, this rack right here is where I dry my prints because everything is a wet process. Um, but we can go in here and this is my dark room and, um, this is, I have two enlargers depending on what size negatives I'm using. I still use really um, large film, either a medium format where the negatives are about this big or large format, which I print on this bigger printer uh, enlarger over here where I use um, negatives that are five by seven. And to make those, you use one of the old fashioned view cameras with the bellows and the dark cloth and, um, it's a production, but you get yeah. fat, giant negatives that make beautiful prints. <laughs> For anyone but, that that isn't familiar, the the enlargers, that's where you actually put the little, uh, the negative in the top and a light yeah, shines. Yeah, so down. you put the negative right up here and there's a light above it. And in this case, there's some condensers that optically change the light and it shines yeah. through the negative onto um, an easel at the bottom that would hold paper and you it's a photosensitive surface on the paper and um, that's how the image is is projected onto the paper and then you go over to this wet side of the dark room where i have these trays lined up with the chemistry so it goes first into um, the developer over here and then into a stop bath and this would all be done in the dark with the safe light on but yeah. Um, and then you fix the image here and then you rinse it here. And then when you're through with all your printing, you put them into this big print washer here and wash them so that they're archival. And, um, then you later go back and tone them and, and do all sorts of other things to them. So that, final, is, that final wash, is that just like regular tap water? It is regular tap water. It is, um, and you, depending on the paper and um, what you've been doing to it and how long you want the print to last, you adjust the wash time. And Thank the, you for that. taking us through your, yeah. a little bit of your process and that, mm -hmm. that kind of setup you have. Um, we have a question here from Kelsey. Uh, what kind of ventilation do you need ah, for the dark? That's a great question, Kelsey. You, so you do need ventilation. And I will show you because I learned the hard way. I used to have a, a vent just in the ceiling until we realized that that was actually pulling the fumes right past my face up into the ceiling, which is not especially helpful. So this piece here is all ventilation underneath it. And there's a switch on the wall that controls it. And I'm very fortunate. My husband is extremely handy. 
and he and some friends of his put all this in for me. But um, it, you shouldn't, if you're wanting to set up a dark room, it shouldn't be that difficult to find um, somebody who can install a proper vent for you. Just be sure you get it behind the chemistry and not over your head. Um, so, Jonathan, you phased out for a minute, but I will say that um, sometimes I also have print in addition to silver printing. I use um, some alternative processes that are even older and more historical. And occasionally I will do cyanotypes, which are um, a blue and white historic process that you may have seen sometimes like this, this blue here and here. These are some older processes that I occasionally do, but not, not nearly as often as the silver things. Okay. Well, thank you for taking us around. It looks like we've got time for one more question if you'd be interested. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, this one, interest, they're interested to know how your vision issues may have influenced, helped, or hindered your work. Uh, was it anything that you, I mean, I'm sure it's something you overcame. Um, it, what, what may have, has, how had, excuse me, how may it have influenced your work? Um, it's hard for me to say completely because I did not start this um, in a serious way until I began having the vision issues. So I don't know what my photographs might have looked like before, but um, I think really it's um, an issue that um, works well with this medium because it's a, by nature slower than like digital. Um, it allows, and I need to work more slowly because with focusing or any close work like that, I just need a little more time. And so this analog system is an easier way, I think, for me to accommodate those needs. Um, and it's something that appeals to me too in the way that I work. I like to slow down and sort of feel the emotions of what's happening with my subject matter and how I'm communing with it. And I'm fine with being really slow. So I think yeah, I think my right. vision has right. affected more the way and the pace in which I work than right. the actual way that the images look in the end. I think it comes off more as care, as it shows in your work. The amount of care and time that you put into each image really shows. There's tons of quality there, and we really, you know, thank you for showing up and hanging out with us today. I appreciate you coming uh, to the stream. This has been Eleanor Owen Kerr. Uh, you can check her out at eleanorowencare.com. This is where you saw uh, some of the images that I brought up earlier. And you can check out more of her work. Eleanor, we appreciate it. Thank you so Thanks. much for coming today. Great to talk to you. Thanks. So, all right. Um, brief introduction in just a moment. First, please feel free to uh, submit any more questions from the Facebook feed if you're commenting on our Facebook post or interacting with our feed, I can see it here and I'm happy to share those questions with our artists uh, if they're happy to have them. And I'm going to start with our next guest. This is going to be uh, Beth Welch. We're bringing you into the stream here. Hi, Beth. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing this well. Afternoon. How are you? Yeah. Uh, hanging in there. Doing pretty good. <laughs> so um, it's good to see you. Thanks for uh, hanging out and coming to the stream. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about the art that you make. Okay, so uh, traditionally I am an oil painter. However, about two years ago, I had a little boy and toddlers and oil paint don't mix. So I've had to switch media. So primarily right now I'm drawing on vellum and uh, it's a series of drawings, and these drawings are of uh, mothers and caretakers and their children. Uh, the layers of vellum, the moms are drawn in charcoal, and they're on the bottom layer, and then the children are drawn in pen and ink on the top layer. And this series is um, a response to my mother's journey with her stroke and dementia. Uh, being a new mom, I find myself looking back on the memories of how my mom raised me and trying to implement 
those memories and those uh, teachings that she did because no one really teaches you how to be a mom. And um, I feel like it's a skill learned through memory and emulation. So emulation. Yeah. That's I'm I'm a dad. Uh, I have a teenage daughter. One of the things that I always tell her is, you know, none of us have ever been human before that we remember or know of. <laughs> and it's always a learning experience, even, you know, if you've had several kids or even if you've been around a while, you still learn every day. And it's, oh, yeah. that's important. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, one of your images here. Let me see if I can get the screen okay. to cooperate. This is going to be, uh, is it safe? Yes, so that's my flat curve gallery piece. Um, I did this one mostly in response to how I'm feeling right now as a mom, kind of holding our little ones close, um, but also being a little bit uh, uncertain about the void and the the world out there. Like, you know, is it safe to go to the grocery store right now? And so um, this is kind of my response on the current situation. So that's why I drew this piece. <laughs> And in, in this piece, we can see, sorry, I'm having some <laughs> technical difficulties here. It's not behaving like it had earlier. Really? So uh, bear with me a moment. You're doing great. Okay. I'll bring the image back up when okay. it's ready to work with me. Um, so in these, uh, if, if you pay attention when I get the image to come back up, you'll be able to see a layer that's uh, a little more obscured mm -hmm. than the front layer, which is more detail. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the pen and charcoal contrast, but also you use two separate pieces of paper. That's, mm -hmm. is that right? Yes. So I do keep the paper separated. Um, in previous pieces, I've done like four or five layers, but so far I've liked the two layers. I find it a little bit more simple and clean, so. Yeah, two separate layers. So the mom's on one and then the kiddo's on the second. Okay, so I'm gonna move into our next question here. Um, so what what kind of was it that made you decide to submit to Flat Curve Gallery? I know uh, we had a submission. Was this, this was the one we just showed, is it safe? Is that right? Yes. So okay. um, I submitted to Flat Curve Gallery because um, it was kind of nice that you guys are engaging the community in such a positive way. Uh, it also made me feel a lot less alone and that I had something to do at the end of the evening. So I liked that you could submit and show and it could be something about COVID or it could be something totally different. And um, it created this kind of communal feeling. And I've liked kind of researching the different artists that I've seen and um, even going on some of their Instagrams and Facebooks and kind of reaching out to them if something was really touching. So it's a it's a nice community and, and it's a I think an excellent cause and reason to respond. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> what I'm working on bringing up next is uh, do you feel forgotten? Yeah. Can you go ahead and kind of lead into your decisions on like what influenced you to create this piece? And uh, I should have it pop up here just shortly. Okay. So I drew this piece um, as part of the new series uh, because my mom with her dementia doesn't know my name anymore. Uh, she only, uh, she kind of recognizes me. I think that she does, but she thinks that I'm my sister Caroline. And so there's uh, sweet Caroline. And this is my mom circa about 1980. And um, so this was kind of a response to how it feels to be a little bit forgotten and then like wondering if my mom feels forgotten uh, because she's in a nursing home now and she doesn't always remember why she's there. So um, yeah, that was a response to that one. Okay. Yeah. And you really, when you go into it, do you, well, first, do you have a, um, you have a website for I, your art? It's um, my name and then art.com. So it's bethwelchart.com. And I also have an Instagram at Beth Welch Studio. The Instagram is a little bit more fun to me because it's, I do a lot of process shots and time lapse videos. So those are always fun. Um, and you can go to her website and see some of the images is with, that we pulled up today. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the study of this one, do you feel forgotten? You can see where, you know, that's a fully formed image of the mother in the background, mm -hmm. obscured by the front layer of paper. Mm -hmm. 
and then you could see much more detail in uh, the child there. And sorry, what was the name? Did you say um, of the website? For the, is this is your sister? Yes, this Caroline. Yeah. Yeah, that's Caroline. Okay, and you can see there much more, you know, uh, detail in the front layer with Caroline there. And I also um, the detail, like we notice all the details of our kids too. So a lot of times as a mom, I do them in charcoal because it's a bit more disheveled and messy and all over the place. And uh, that's kind of how I feel like when I'm putting myself together, uh, a lot of the times it's much more haphazard. And then, um, but if my child comes home from daycare with like a bruise on his knee, I notice every single thing and I check on it every day. And so the pen and ink is much more detailed and nitpicky in that sense. And that was purposeful. I appreciate your attention to detail and the unique way that you've been able to to show the idea of oh, uh, this part in your life. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned earlier Instagram, yeah. and the last time that I was there, I saw that you uh, had a little bit to say about your new coworker. I do. I have a new office. coworker. Um, so he, we're all kind of working from home right now, yeah. and he's quite small. Um, mm -hmm. he's quite sticky and he is into just about everything. So, uh, I have a sweet little baby boy and he is my new, uh, partner in crime. Uh, my day job is the exhibitions coordinator at the Louisiana art and science museum. And so we are actually in the middle of an install whenever COVID hit. So we have about three quarters of the sculptures up right now for a Frank Hayden show. Whenever it does open, please come by. It's going to be gorgeous. Um, but everything is on hold at this moment. So right now, uh, a normal day in my life at the museum was cleaning cases, installing work, packaging work, uh, shipping things. And now it is... Um, a lot of research, which is awesome. I'm all about some research. So I'm getting to discover lots of new artists for potential future exhibitions, um, researching grants, lots of Zoom meetings, um, trying to come up with some virtual content for the museum. So it's changed, but it's still encouraging and wonderful. And my coworkers have been phenomenal uh, in understanding that I do have a toddler at home. So um, yeah. some days I work yeah, until... You know, some days it's a little yeah. bit of a later night. I might work until seven or nine. Um, and that just fits around nap times and when he's asleep and whenever I can squeeze in work. So it's been lovely, though. I mean, as lovely I, as we get. Lovely. I, I have an eight-month-old son, Felix, and um, his little play pens right here next to me. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll reach over and oh, we'll yeah. do a little, a little fun thing. And then I'll get back to work. And it's always kind of a little bit back and forth. And, oh, yeah. I have a um, bit of toys in every room. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I feel that one. Um, we have a few more moments just before we move on to our uh, onto our next guest okay. here in a moment. Um, would you care to take a question? Sure. What do we got? I've got one here. Uh, which pencil is your favorite? And what I'll ask, what kind of pen uh, is it that you like using so, the most? Right now, I like my Micron pens. Uh, so I have a bucket of them that I keep and then a drawer full of the new ones. Um, so right now I do the micron pens and then the background pens, sorry, the background pencils. I like the general's charcoal. It's these bad boys here. Um, you can get them at just about any, uh, store. Uh, so yeah, I like those. Those are my brands of choice. And I think Kelsey had asked, uh, to look at the, yeah. the different layers. Yeah, that was going to be my next. It's a good thing I put on pants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so these are kind of the scale. You can see how they separate and then they're like that. And then I do have some of the smaller pieces. The is it safe piece is about this size. They're 24 by 24. And they're all the separate layers as well. Yeah, I appreciate the scale at which you do this because I know how hard it can be to jam a lot of detail into a smaller image, but taking it and making it a little bit bigger, you have a little more freedom. And I, I, yes. I appreciate that that method of working. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Beth. I appreciate you uh, spending some time with us this afternoon. And uh, it's been a delight talking with you. And um, thank you all for, for inviting me. It's been oh, yeah. totally flattering. Thank you. And be, for, uh, be sure to check Beth out at um, bethwelchart.com and without any 
further ado, we're going to move on. Let's speak with Chloe Marie of Alabaster Stag. Chloe, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, uh, I've been pretty good. It's It's been a learning experience here um, in the last few minutes, <laughs> but it's been a good time and I'm, I'm glad to speak with you all. Um, yeah. So Chloe, tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell us about uh, your art or, you know, if you want to speak on um, Alabaster Stag, maybe how they, how you all came together. Um, well, yeah, my name is Chloe Marie. I'm a vocalist, songwriter, and actor um, from here in Baton Rouge. Um, Alabaster Stag, we started in 2016. Um, I started the band with our current drummer and bassist. Um, we also have a guitarist and a piano player now. Um, and yeah, we really, we play a mix of all different genres, um, original music. We've been lucky to play some really awesome shows around here the last couple of years. Um, but personally, I, yeah, like I said, I'm a singer, but I also do a lot of theater work, primarily with Theater Baton Rouge here in the city, which is such a fantastic performing arts organization. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's pretty much what I do. So it sounds like you got uh, a little a little hand in everything. That's. Um... Really I'm sure, especially now in this in this weird time where we're all teleconferencing and you know streaming on live and things like that. Um, what is it? Or what is it that you found, if anything, uh, lately that that kind of helps get the message out? Like, how are you? Are you portraying your music in a different way? Or are you using any different services to get that music out there? Um, honestly, more so during this time, I've been um, I think working on a lot of things introspectively. Um, I've been practicing a lot more, taking time to develop certain skills that I always told myself I didn't have, you know, enough time for. Um, so it hasn't been, for me personally, it hasn't been so much about trying to reach the audience in a different way. It's about taking this deep breath that we all collectively are having right now and using it to become better for when we're out of this. So, so gearing up for the big show at the end of the year, Everybody's finally let it out of the house. Here's Alabaster Stag. Oh, it's going to be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be that's, crazy. I, that's right. All right. Um, so in saying that, I, I looked up a little bit up on your Facebook page. Um, it's the Alabaster Stag on Facebook. Um, you note that one of your like genres is Neo Soul. Yes. In in that genre, I mean, you're bound to have if if you're so talented and you're you're you know uh, you're you're acting you're you're doing music. What's one of your influences on your music? What, is there a particular uh, musician that you're a fan of or that you feel like has pushed you in a certain direction? Um, I personally, I think honestly, my biggest influence is probably Ella Fitzgerald. Um, and I feel like as a as a vocalist, I really look to her style a lot and really um, the way that she used her voice as an instrument. Um, I think that she's probably my biggest inspiration. But as far as writing, um, it really just, my inspirations are all over the place. It comes from going outside and looking at the trees or just meditating in my room. Um, so I think more so than any specific artist or musician or anything like that, I think that my biggest influence is probably my life and my surroundings and um, current circumstances and stuff like that, you know. No, John, can you hear me? Okay. I think something weird is happening with the computer. Hey, that was me. Sorry. Uh, hey. Today of all days, my internet has started to pick up and down a little bit, and uh, I apologize. I've, I've thankfully been able to just pop back in. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a quick question. And then uh, if you are interested in doing, I know you mentioned doing a small performance. If you're interested, we'd love to have, yeah. we'd love to have you. Uh, let's see. Um, we've got 
a question here from Kelsey. Is it, uh, do you have a favorite piece of technology that you use or uh, are, do you use any, um, favorite any piece vocal of synthesizers? Do you have any like piece of specific yeah. equipment, oh, a favorite yeah. mic? Not yet. I, really, I have my eyes on this one vocal processor, but it's so expensive. I might get it soon, but um, okay. honestly, I think just my favorite piece of tech that I have right now is my guitar. Yeah. And uh, so if we, we have a few minutes, do you want to go ahead and uh, get set up and do a little piece for us? Yeah, absolutely. So my awesome roommate, Nelson Williams, um, he plays in a couple bands around here, Brothers Bear and uh, James McCann. I think he played with as well. Um, he's going to accompany me. And we're just going to do a song that I think everybody's pretty familiar with, um, Landslide. I feel like it's just a really fitting, really fitting tune for the times that we're in with everything and being pretty much in a state of transition. Um, and okay, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to make you full screen here. And then... Uh... We'll pop back into this view at the end. We'll let you do a little shout out and then uh, we'll we'll call it. But yeah, thank you both for performing. Thank you both for being on the stream today. I'm going to uh, let you have it. This is uh, Chloe Marie and Alabaster Stag. Nope, not that one. <laughs> I took my love and I took it down Climbed the mountain and I turned around And I saw my reflection in a snow-covered hill Where the landslide brought down Oh, mirror in the sky well, there's can the child within my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing ocean tides? Can I handle the seasons of my life? Will I be afraid of changing? Cause I feel my life around you. But time makes you bolder. Children get older and I'm getting older too. Well, I've been afraid of changing Cause I feel my life around you But time makes you bolder Children get older I'm getting older too yeah, I'm getting older too. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm getting older. Wow, thank you so much. That's amazing. And uh, do do one favor for me again. Um, do another round of introductions. You're Chloe Marie, and this is... I'm Chloe Marie, this is Nelson Williams. Um, where, where can we find you at on social media or online? So you can find, I have um, my personal artist page is on Facebook as Chloe Marie, but then also you can follow my band, Alabaster Stag, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. I also have all of that as well. Um, and yeah, we keep it pretty updated um, about what's going on. So if you guys would like to see more, follow me and all that. 
absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you, for for being on the stream with us today, and uh, we appreciate you having you. It was a wonderful performance and a great interview. Um, we're going to go ahead and close out. Thank you both, and have a great rest of your quarantine lockdown. <laughs> Whenever, how long does last? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, so there we have it. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for watching. This has been Artists in Residences. Um, please consider following Baton Rouge Gallery and all of our wonderful artists that have joined us today and in the past and hopefully in the future uh, <laughs> on social media. Um, just thank you to our artists so much for inviting us into your spaces today um, and sharing a little bit of your lives with us here while we're all kind of separate but together. Um, again, a special thanks to Breck, all of our donors and members. Uh, without any of you, none of this would be possible. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you.